Hello and welcome to our Fireside Friday Chats with OCD Game Changers. Yay! Um, thank you for being here. Thank you for joining us. My name is Chrissy Hodges. I am the founder and executive director of OCD Game Changers. I'm a certified peer support specialist here in the state of Colorado, working with people worldwide to support them and normalize them and also connect them to referrals for OCD. And I'm the founder of OCD Peers. There we go. OCD Peers, which is a group peer practice that we run groups every single day. Um, and we have all different countries join us. So please go to OCDPeers.com. More importantly, I'm going to, before I introduce our guest, I'm going to tell you that wherever you are tomorrow night, you will have two hours and 45 minutes that you can click on and join us for our big fundraiser called Ignite the Fire. Final thoughts on COVID 2020. How how did this happen? Where did this come from? Well, fireside chats started because of COVID. I was freaking out and I needed some help. <laughs> I needed some normalization. I needed people in my community to come onto my platform and tell me how they were feeling so I could help feel like what I was feeling was correct and normal and I wasn't so scared. So we had about 20 people come on in the course of a couple months and share how they were doing. Some people were angry, some people were hopeful, some people were frustrated and sad, and other people were just trying to make the best of it. And so it's been several months. What we wanted to do is bring all of those people back. And each person is gonna check in four to five minutes throughout the night, and they're gonna tell us where they are now from where they were when they first came on the fireside chat. It is also a fundraiser. So please get your wallets ready to donate to OCD Game Changers as we are a 501c3. And we're also partnering with Not Alone Notes and a portion of proceeds goes to their new initiative, Not Alone Totes. You'll find out more tomorrow. Make sure you tune in 8 p.m. Eastern Standard Time, literally for two hours and 45 minutes. <laughs> And we will be on OCD Game Changers Facebook page right here. And then we'll be on OCD Game Changers YouTube channel if you or a loved one is not on Facebook and wants to uh, join us. So I'm going to remind you again at the end. So don't you worry. You are not going to forget. Now, I want to turn it over to our guest, Mimi Cole. I'm so excited for you to be here. I'm really excited about the topic we're going to talk about. I think it's so important. So please introduce yourself and tell us all what you do in your advocacy. Yeah, so thanks for having me on, Chrissy. It's yes. such a pleasure. Um, so I am currently a graduate student studying clinical rehabilitation and mental health counseling. Um, I live in North Carolina at the moment, but I've also lived in Nashville and Virginia. Um, let's see. So I started off my Instagram um, about a year and a half ago, I think. Um, and it's been such a great community and such a great place for me. Um, I so I was diagnosed with OCD um, in 2018, I believe. Um, but I suffered so for several years as many people um, have the same experience with intrusive thoughts and compulsive behaviors. And um, I just felt so alone in it and so much shame around my thoughts. And I didn't know um, that there was a name for it and that other people experienced it and that they didn't reflect my values. Um, and so I promised myself when I was in the thick of it that um, if I figured out a name for this or some sort of healing solution, I would tell other people about it. Um, and so here I am today. Um, I kind of skipped the me messy middle part, but you know, there was a lot of therapy and a lot of ERP and that's really, really, really hard. Um, so I have a lot of compassion for individuals who also suffer as well. Um, you have a podcast. Let everybody know what your podcast is. Yes, I um so I just started a podcast. It's called The Lovely Becoming as well. Um, and I love it. I have some amazing guests. Um, and I'm so honored um to talk with them. Um, and I have some episodes out on OCD, um, on eating disorders, intuitive eating, a lot of great information. Excellent. I I did listen to some of your podcasts. I heard that um I got a shout out from Miss Allegra Cassins. Yes. <laughs> 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 she was like, Chrissy, you have to listen. And it was like, how do you do with ne negative comments? Chrissy Hodges. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, you have to have a support network, right? Yes. And this like, Allegra and I are regularly working through what happens when we 
encounter things on social media. So I, I loved it and I thought it was great. Yes, yes, I love that you got to listen. It's it's so fun. <laughs> so, um, so yeah, so let's just kick it off. Everybody who's listening and thank you for being here, everyone. Um, we are going to talk today, um, which is something I know that you're really passionate about, which is body image. And um, I also wanted to throw a little bit of ADD, which is body dysmorphic disorder in. Understanding that this is probably going to be a little bit more about lived experience and advocacy. So we're technically not going to be providing clinical advice or therapeutic tools. We're just going to talk about this topic because right now uh, this is a big deal. And I'm just waiting for the tides to turn on social media for people to really start talking about this because lots of people are struggling and the holidays are really bringing this out for people when they're actually getting out of their house and seeing people. And then they're going, I've gained weight. I look different. I feel different. I haven't been in normal clothes for a while. Um, so people are really, really suffering. So Mimi, thank you for being on to talk about this very, very important topic today. I'm really excited. So before we get into that, I want to ask you something that just came up while you were talking. I love that you said I made the promise to myself when I figured out a name to it. Because when I was in the, when I, I already knew I had a CD. Mm -hmm. I attempted suicide and hospitalized and I found Steven Phelpson and did therapy with him. And in the middle of therapy, I was sitting on my, the psychology steps, the building in my college. And I was like, I'm going to talk about this one day. Like, I'm going to share with the, I'm going to, I'm going to share my story and it's going to change people's lives. And literally it took me 15 years. <laughs> wow. Yes. <laughs> so finally do it. Cause I went right back into the shame. I went into the stigma. I went into the fear of what if I disclose all this? So I do want to ask you um, when you got through it and when you did get through all the kind of messy stuff with therapy, um, what was it like taking that first step to, I am going to do this. I don't care. Yeah. I mean, that promise I made to myself, I thought, um, you know, people are suffering in silence right now and I needed my voice um, before. And so I, I knew that I know that my voice is important and I know that um, there are people who need to hear the messages that I have to share um, and the things that I've learned and who don't have access to um, maybe a diagnosis or a therapist. Um, initially and I saw other people doing it so I saw other people talking about their eating disorders talking about their journey with healing their relationship with food and body and I was really encouraged and inspired and I thought if they can do it safely and feel okay like I can do that as well um mm -hmm. it took some time I think um and I was cautious very cautious at first so when I first started Instagram I was very much like here's something that could work for some people and like here's a tool but like it might not work for you and that's okay. Um, so very just like <laughs> specifically trying not to get into my story too much. Um, although I really wanted to balance that vulnerability because I knew that was what got people interested. And so, um, yeah, it was a very interesting balance at first for sure. Oh, excellent. Thank you. And hi, Deirdre. Um, she says hi to both of us. Yay. Yay. Thank you for being here. Um, okay. So let's, let's, let's get a little bit into the body image piece. Um, I really haven't had a show where we've talked about this much at all. However, I just, I, I know how co-occurring it can be and that this is such a shameful topic. Um, I've just recently started speaking out a little bit, but I still have this weird invisible layer of shame and I'm like, stop it. I talk about the groinal, like, and I don't have shame. How am I having shame about this? Come on now. Yes. <laughs> So let's talk about um, talk about that, um, whatever you want to start with or open with or, or however you want to address it. What has been your experience in struggling with the body image or have you struggled with an eating disorder? Mm -hmm. Yeah, so I did have an eating disorder. Um, and interestingly enough, it started off as orthorexia, um, and which is interesting because a lot of people with orthorexia don't have body image struggles, um, but I definitely did. Um, what is what, what is that? Yeah, so orthorexia is an obsession or fixation with clean or rigid right eating. Um, and it's kind of considered like the great divide or the great like connection between eating disorders and OCD. Um, and oh. so, yeah, it can be thought of as a set of obsessions with um, clean eating and compulsions with like eating raw foods, only caring to have it prepared in certain ways. Um, and so it can be very 
very interesting. Wow, I have never heard of that. This is the first time ever. This is amazing. Yeah, yeah it's really important. It's not in the DSM, but it is a very real and valid diagnosis. And um, a lot of treatment centers will treat it as well. Okay. And so you were struggling with that? Yes. And this was um, co occurring with OCD, or was this the whole OCD? Co occurring. So we had it all. <laughs> okay. Wow. Um, so yeah, so body image wise, um, I always struggled with my body. Um, I always felt like I was, um, you know, doctors might have said like lose weight. And I was like, okay, like I need to do that. I need to do that because, um, you know, when you're taught your body is bad your whole life and you're taught that you need to shrink and be smaller, you know, that those internal messages really play a role in how you show up in relationships and how you um, interact with other people. Um, and so you know, I like to say, like, not everyone loses weight when they have an eating disorder. Um, and uh, yeah, I don't like to go into too many specifics about like my diagnoses or anything. I do say orthorexia because I think it, it needs more attention. And um, but yeah, so body image was really hard for me. And it still is. Um, I have a lot of friends who are smaller than me who struggle with eating disorders as well. Um, so that can be really hard. Um, and I think there's just this, this, I this, like, feeling like nobody will, I'll be the biggest one. Or like, if I share this with other people, like I'm going to be the one who is different than everyone else. And so I think this unknown, the shame comes from the idea of like, what if I'm the only one? So mm -hmm. I, you know, I can, I think that in the relation, just to kind of share my experience as of late of being able to talk about it is um, I've, I've, I've always been conscious, I guess, of body image, but I rec recently in the last few years, OCD has attacked my um, ability to run and do the things that I would do to, to just like kind of help, you know, just kind of the everyday movement. And um, when that happened, um, yeah, I started to gain some weight. I started to feel differently. Um, I'm also a lot older in the last few years, like age contributes, you know, all that. And, um, I found that probably the, the biggest thing is I, even though I, I felt like I was struggling to me, it, it was this, I don't want to tell people that I'm struggling with it. So then they see me and go, Oh yeah, she's struggling with it or scrutinize how I looked based on the fact that I'm actually admitting that I'm struggling with body image. And I, I, like I would, I almost have insight into it. Like that just pisses me off. Like who cares? I see people all the time. And if they've said they've gained weight, I'm like, okay. So anyway, what else? Like, what have you been up to? Like, I don't see that, but I definitely put it back on myself of like everybody seeing that. And, and so that's been a little bit of the struggle of finally kind of just speaking out about it. But, um, it definitely has removed the shame a little once I did finally speak out. So that's good. Yeah, absolutely. I like what you said about um, how like we worry about bringing it up to other people. And so there's this really like half of us that's like, I want it to be brought up and I want to talk about it. But then there's this whole other, whole other side of us that's like, if I bring it up, then they'll pay attention to it and they wouldn't have paid attention to it before, which is so interesting. Yes. yes. And maybe even a step further would be that's all they're going to pay attention to. And they're not going to pay attention to me, the yeah. core person of who I am. And they can't get past now how I look. Um, interesting. I just had like a little epiphany over here. <laughs> I have had to, um, I've had some really good conversations with friends after finally opening up to people and finding out that they feel the same way. and. Um, in me, it, it doesn't help because it's like reassurance. In me telling that person, I have never noticed your weight fluctuate. And they're like, whatever I do. And I'm like, okay, so I know you you notice it, but I don't. And I'm not going to reassure you anymore. That's actually helped to normalize what's going on, to, to normalize it for me and to, and to really push into looking at what my core worth is. Mm -hmm. Um. And, and I've talked a little bit about this. I would love to hear your take on this. 
I've talked about this some. I don't know how to talk about it. I'm really new to this. So I might even say things that are wrong. So Mimi, you can call me out if I do. Um, <laughs> but like, I have discovered that as I have worked through this in the last six to eight months, and a little bit mine went into BDD. I'll talk about that later. Um, I've started to also like waver on my worth and have really realized that, wow, for a, a long time, I was taught my worth it was dependent on how I looked, whether that be cultural, whether that be just genetic, hereditary, whatever, like that was taught to me. And so I, I, while I'm struggling with the image piece, I'm also struggling with worth. And I've had to dive a little bit deep into, okay, how do I reevaluate my worth? Does that make sense? Yes, absolutely. Uh, Have you felt that way or can you relate? Yes, very much so. I definitely tied my weight to my worth and what I looked like and what size I wore. And even just the little things like what glove size I picked up. Was that small? Was that large? Like yes. little things where um, that showed up for me. And, and I really have to be careful to notice it even now um, because even though I've kind of come to peace with my body size, um, there are still ways that the society that we live in kind of tells us like, oh, make sure you have a smaller size and like that's a good thing. Or like if you've lost weight and someone compliments you, that's a good thing. But we have to really, really think about how compliments on weight loss impact the way we feel about ourselves when we gain weight. Um, mm -hmm. And so for me, I think we should never compliment weight loss. I think we should never um, really make comments about people's weight because it's really harmful to how they feel about themselves and 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 because of the way that we've been taught. Um, and I think something that is really important to me is the word unlearning and unlearning the narratives that we've been told about ourselves and unlearning the ideas that um, one thing equals another, like our weight equals our worth. And that takes time. Mm -hmm. When this is a question, this may be out of the scope or it's something you may not want to talk about, but I um, just in doing advocacy and, and what obviously you've done a ton of work on this, when I agree with you 100%, um, talking about weight is just inappropriate. Mm -hmm. it, it's, it just is. Like, it, like if y'all, you, if you're going to see somebody and they've lost weight, just don't be like, oh, you look good. Don't just stop. Compliment their hair. Um, <laughs> Um, but, uh, if someone is experiencing this, which let's segue a little into what a lot of people are going through now in COVID, um, people are going to venture out for Christmas, whether people think it's okay or not, whatever we're going to, and then the vaccine's going to come. We are going to have to start going back out and you may have lost weight. You may have gained weight. You may have stayed the same, but you just feel weird having to be in regular clothes and being out or whatever. And in seeing people, if someone says something that is going to trigger or feel like it puts a spotlight on you, I like to say that, like puts the spotlight on how you're looking now. Um, do you have any suggestions of how to diffuse that in the moment? Yes. Um, okay. I, first of all, am a big fan of proactive boundaries. And so I like to say beforehand, like, um, before I see people, like, here's what is not okay. And here's what's okay. Um, mm -hmm. the things that I can think of, of course, there's going to be something that comes up for sure. Um, so when things come up, there are a couple ways you can handle the situation. You can distract and say, you know what? It's a really nice day outside <laughs> and just completely turn away from the conversation if you're not comfortable with addressing it head on mm -hmm. you can talk mm -hmm. about that's actually really harmful i'm working on healing my relationship with my body can you not talk about my weight or my size um it makes me uncomfortable um you can also kind of explain like why that's harmful and kind of get really into the roots of it um and say like oh i have this resource that i read or i'm learning about something like that and uh yeah there are lots of ways to address it mm -hmm. I grew up in the, um, in Georgia and, and we, I don't know, there's this, I don't know if it's just passed down from generation to generation, but there's this tradition that when anybody would walk in, someone comments on how you look weight wise. It, it was, I remember growing up and being like, having to check myself before I walked into a big event, like, well, I know that aunt's going to be there and she's going to be like, Lord, Chrissy, you gain weight, you know, or something. <laughs> 
and like, and it's, it's funny. I, it's not funny, but kind of, we went to Thanksgiving um, and just, we shared it with like one of my best friends in the entire world. And um, I had that interest. It's very interesting. I had that memory in my head because um, just going out and knowing I felt different. I felt different in my skin. I probably maybe look a little different or whatever. And I just thought, what if I walk in and the first thing he says is, wow, you're fat or you've got, you know what I mean? And, and it was almost like I had this weird insight of like, he is not going to say that, but I still was so worried about it to the point where I wanted to avoid. Mm -hmm. And then I walked in and the first thing he said was, do you want some wine? <laughs> <laughs> Kind of like even exposure therapy, like learning that maybe people won't comment on your body and, and maybe they will and you'll be able to cope with it more than you thought you could. And maybe mm -hmm. you're resilient and able to handle those types of things. Mm -hmm. Oh, exposure. We love it. <laughs> <laughs> um, so I also know that when people are struggling with, and I, I, I definitely don't want to get into the clinical piece of this as well. But I, but I also know that when we talk about vaccines and we talk about like normalizing back out to life, people start to panic because then they start to think, Oh my gosh, I need to get out and start running. I need to do this, which we know is not healthy when it's going to be the compulsive exercise, compulsive under eating. And there's a timeline. Um, so as we're kind of moving into 2021, um, as someone who advocates for this, um, is there something that you can suggest or talk to us a little bit about of resisting the urgency to need to do what we think we need to do to fit back in to the real world? Yeah, I'd say the first thing that comes to mind is that clothes are meant to fit you, not you meant to fit the clothes. And so just let go, like let yourself go on a shopping spree if you can afford it um, and buy new clothes. That's OK. It's OK if they don't fit you um, anymore. And a, a great tool my therapist taught me um, was it's called delay, distract, decide. So you delay the urge and then you distract yourself and then you make a decision about it. So if that's like delaying for five minutes, that's fine. Distract yourself with the show for a couple minutes and then decide, is that in alignment with my values? Is that really something I want to do? Or was that kind of an urgent in the moment? Like I have to do this. Mm, I love that. I wrote it down. Yes. <laughs> <he's great. laughs> um, so what has been your take at, you know, have you seen an uptick? What are, what are some of the things that you're hearing from, from people um, through advocacy or, um, or anything as far as body image as we've worked through 2020? Yeah, so I've been a bit sheltered um, in terms of this year. So I've made my Instagram all very like um, non-diet weight inclusive uh, providers. And so honestly, I haven't heard much about like going on diets beyond like when I casually turn on the radio and I'm like, oh gosh, it's still going on. I forgot. Um, and, you know, when I go out in public every now and then I'll hear comments um, like I was at an ice cream store and someone was like, I gained weight just by looking at this. And I was like, that's inappropriate. That's mm -hmm. going to affect everyone around you, including yourself. Um, and so I think, yeah, for sure. Um, it probably is happening around me, but I, I've been so, you know, at home a lot and um, just with people that I trust and care about. And I think to an extent that can be really good for me. Um, just because I'm not hearing all the messages and getting inundated. Um, and so, but yeah, the world still keeps going around diet culture and still keeps um, trying to change our bodies and make us shrink and be smaller and shrink and be smaller until we're non-existent. And I think it's beautiful when we learn to take up space and when we learn that we are, are good and find our value outside of our bodies um, mm -hmm. because our bodies contain our, our personalities and our souls and ourselves. Um, and that's what's so important. Mm -hmm. If someone has had kind of the, what I like to call the invisible worth of um, your, your worth is defined by your body size mm -hmm. and they are ready to start the journey. They're ready to go. I'm, I don't want to do this even, anymore, even though it's hard to resist because, you know, when you've been indoctrinated with things for so long, but when you know it's time, 
Do you have any suggestions for people where they can just get started at, at exploring their new worth or or letting go of some of those old um, kind of indoctrinated belief systems? I definitely would start with two things. The first one is get rid of the scale. You don't need it. Yes. You really need to get rid of it so you don't weigh yourself. You're not tempted. Don't reorder it. <laughs> so that's a really important thing. You can give it to your therapist. You can smash it. You can do whatever you want to get rid of it. That's really important. Um, and then I would say also podcasts were really super helpful for me. Um, I'll say Food Psych was a really good one for me. Um, we're Not Weighing is a great podcast as well. Um, really just things that challenge the ideas that that weight is an effective measure of health and that weight is um, somehow tied to our morality. Mm -hmm. Mimi, I have not weighed myself in I don't know how many years. <laughs> <laughs> it is toxic. It is. It, it is. It's toxic. And when I, I think the last time I went to the doctors, it was a few years ago, I was struggling with like adrenal fatigue. And I got on the scale and I was like, do not tell me. I don't want to. And they were like, oh, it's not so bad. And I'm like, no, 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 no. Like, what? stop. Like, I don't want to know because it will mess with me for weeks or months. <laughs> Yes, I agree. I went to the doctor this morning and um, they said like, all right, step on the scale. I said, do I have to? And they said no. And I was like, great. Thanks. <laughs> I 100% agree. I'm so glad that you said that. Yeah. Um, and I, I think a, a point that I, I wanted to just follow up with in my own journey, I, of course, it, it probably isn't going to apply to anybody else, but what I have been doing a lot of reflecting this year of of trying to figure out how to shift my worth. It's, it's been successful, which is, is cool. It's still hard. Um, but I've also thought about the different times in my life where I can probably, what has helped me is to think about those times and think, um, yes, I had a very small body or I had the athletic body or whatever it was, but I still wasn't happy. And so recognizing that it still wasn't enough then has really made me think, okay, well then what is enough? And my mind always ventures to, it has nothing to do with my size. It has to do with my values and, and figuring out what my worth is for more tangible things, even like love and community and connectedness. So um, that's really helped me to really remember that even at that point, it, it wasn't enough. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. I agree. I think there are times where I'm like, I only wish I could be the size that I used to be. And at that size, I was just like compulsively exercising and under eating and still just like so frustrated with the way that I was. And you're right. Like there's, we never reach, whenever we reach that elusive goal, even if you do, then we make a smaller goal. And, you know, that's just not really life. Mm hmm I like that. It's not really life. It's true. Um, I do want to segue really quick into BDD. Um, and we, I actually think I talked about this a little bit with uh, Mary Torres when she was on a couple days ago. And um, I'll just talk really quick um, yeah. about it just to bring some awareness to it. Um, a lot of clients I'm working with and peer support and a lot of people are really struggling with body dysmorphic disorder. And while this is not an eating disorder at all, it's just, it's very tied to uh, body image, um, maybe not clinically or technically, but, you know, people um, really suffer with their body image when they're dealing with body dysmorphic disorder. So I just wanted to say to you uh, out there, um, you know, BDD is really, it's, I think, I, I'm in, incorrect. Um, it's under the umbrella of OCD or it's tied to OCD, but you don't have to have OCD to have BDD. So that's important to understand. And I've never experienced it until this year. And a lot of people aren't experiencing it or are experiencing it now because we are, we are sitting and staring at ourselves on camera. <laughs> <laughs> and when you, you have to look back at yourself when you, you know, would maybe look in the mirror a little bit every once in a while, all of a sudden you're like, uh, like for me, it's like, oh my God, the jowls are coming in. And then I'm like trying to, okay, now they're not there. <laughs> <laughs> and I 
find myself doing that on camera or like i'll see like i always have this one this is what i call this the ocd wrinkle because when i'm ruminating i'm like this <laughs> And so I'll see it when I'm on camera and then I start going, you know, so it's not there. So I know I'm looking at the camera like this. And so <laughs> but a lot, a lot of people are now experiencing this because they are having to see themselves over and over and over. They're seeing themselves. In, and I've said this before. I actually did a video about this on my YouTube channel. You know, they're looking at themselves in different cameras. So um, me on StreamYard is very different than me on Zoom or me on FaceTime or Skype. And so I, you know, when I, whenever I'm on one of the platforms, it's, oh my God, like I look, why do I look like this? And then I may see myself later in the day when I'm meeting with someone on FaceTime and I'm like, wait a minute, I, is, is it not there? Or do I not look like that? And then I get in the spiral about what's going on. What do I really look like? And so then I just catch myself in the mirror, examining self, but then I don't want to look in the mirror because I don't want to see how ugly and gross I am. Um, so, I'm just going to share with you a couple of things that have helped me a recognizing that this is going on has been the best thing. Just recognizing. Um, I was worried for a little while. It wasn't that. And I really just was ugly, <laughs> which is the classic OCD. Like it's maybe you don't have this and this really is true. Um, and so I had to accept the uncertainty. Maybe I'm ugly and that's okay. I can still my, do my job being ugly. And so I just decided that. The second thing is I do whatever I can, just make the avoidance, but it just helps and it helps give me a break is um, I just do what I can to minimize having to look. So if that means like I don't totally avoid, but I just strategically make sure that I'm not checking and rechecking when I'm looking at the camera of like looking at myself, I may even go, I'm going to look at myself for, you know, the next 20 seconds. And I'm not going to examine, I'm not going to do any you know, rumination or anything. And then I'm going to move on. So it's, it becomes less of an urgency and more of just me really exposing myself to it or minimizing the opportunity for me to even see myself. If it's a really important meeting and I don't want to get distracted by my wrinkles. Um, <laughs> <laughs> and then just reading up, um, you know, stories on BDD and helping me to understand that this is a real thing. And it, it really is impacting a lot of people right now. So if you are experiencing that, please know that you aren't alone. If you're experiencing it to a degree where you really feel like it's taking over your life, please seek help. Please go to someone who can treat OCD, BDD. Typically they go hand in hand. I'm saying typically because not everybody will, but the treatment is very much the same. So just wanted to quickly address that. So, you know, um, and that you are not alone in this. A lot of people are all of a sudden like, very much honing on on what they look like and how they're feeling because they're just stuck looking at themselves all day. And it's exhausting. Um, even if, you know, it, it, even if it doesn't feel like an OCD, BDD is very, very similar. Um, and do some research on it, get the help that you need. Do you have any comments, Mimi, or anything about BDD? Um, yeah, I mean, the treatment is pretty similar for um, OCD and it's kind of treated as like a body image obsession and compulsion. And so, um, yeah, definitely seek out help from a specialist and know that you're not alone for sure. Mm -hmm. What's it been like for you during this year having to adapt to like staring at the camera the whole time? <laughs> it's so, so <laughs> interesting. So I've been online for um, my semester and I've been in 15 hours this semester. Um, so 15 hours a week, I'm staring at myself plus more oh sometimes. Um, I like to uh, put like, uh, I don't know what it's called, but in Zoom where like the, the speaker view or whatever. Um, and I like to scroll around and see other people's faces <laughs> to see if they look like they're paying attention. <laughs> <laughs> and so um, I'm easily distracted, um, which is really my downfall. But um, yeah, I try not to look at myself too much. Um, it is interesting, though, because like in a classroom, you're not seeing yourself all the time. But on Zoom, you are constantly looking at your image reflected back at you. And so that's really different. And I think um, really important to acknowledge that like that's going to affect how you feel about yourself. Mm -hmm. I think that was, this was a big thing that took a lot of people by surprise. Yes. It was like, let's work from home and we'll just use Zoom. And then like two months later, you're like, I can't believe I have to look at myself as much. Yes. Yes. <laughs> Unknown side effect. 
<laughs> and then comparing yourself to how other people look on the camera as well. That's always hard. Absolutely. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So you are in school. Just wanted to get some, I, I just want to get a little bit more information so people can know like about you. So you're in school right now. You're getting your master's degree and you're becoming a therapist. Yes. So where are you going to go with that? Um, so I want to work for a group practice one day. Um, every month or so I change where I want to go. My next, like, I want to go is LA. So we'll see um, about that. <laughs> Um, the last one was Nashville, back to Nashville. Um, so we'll see where I head with that. But um, I'd really like to start offering more things. It is a little hard because I'm not a therapist yet to um, feel like I'm, I have things to offer to people um, like physically, but um, yeah. Mm -hmm. Where do you think your advocacy will go? Or where do you want your advocacy to go? So I definitely want to write a book really, really badly. I think yes. Um, so I started writing, I, it's only like three chapters in, but, um, I'm just so excited to share more, um, about what my story looked like, um, and kind of raise awareness around OCD and eating disorders, um, and, and how we can heal from them too, and find healing in therapy. Um, and so I'm really thrilled about that and excited and looking forward to things like that. Um, I just made a booklet on orthorexia and I'm going to launch my website soon. Um, and then the podcast, I can't wait for more guests to be on. I've recorded like two or three this week. So very excited. That's awesome. Please send us any information that you have and we'll post it on Game Changers as well. Awesome. That would be awesome. I really appreciate the support. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I, I, I wrote, I did, I wrote my memoir, so I know exactly what it feels like where you're like, um, I'm writing, I'm a few chapters in and how is this going to work? And is this going to happen? Yes. <laughs> gonna <look> like? <laughs> Just so you know, and, and I know it, it won't take you this long. It took me five years to write mine. Um, and it literally was like, I wrote the first draft. It was just all stream of consciousness writing. I put it, I put it away and didn't look at it for six months. Then I brought it out again. Didn't want to edit, put it away. <laughs> I did that five times. <laughs> Amazing. <laughs> And then when I finally did it, it was, it was, it was amazing. And, and in all honesty, the information that you'll be able to provide people for the kind of the comorbidity between OCD and eating disorders, it is so, so, so needed. People really need to know they're not alone with it. And there's just a lot of misinformation out there too. Yes. Yes. So I'm really so excited to bring that into the light. Yeah. So being able to see actually the lived experience piece of it, I think is going to be really helpful. So any projections on when it's going to be done? So for Christmas this year, I asked to go somewhere for a couple of days and just have time to write. Um, nice. So I'm really looking forward to that time. Hopefully the ideas will come maybe by the time I graduate, maybe. <laughs> what is that? 2022 in May. Okay. Awesome. Yeah. Oh, that gives you plenty of time. Yes. Yes. <laughs> I've, I've just started writing my second, which is kind of the emotional follow-up to what I went through. And um, it really just helps to just write it all out and then, and then pull and throw in and pull everything, you know, it's like that, that that's the process that seems to help me the most, but I'm excited for you. I will be eager to read it. Um, yes, me too. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh Oh, I have one question in mind. Is there anything else you want to share with us um, about your journey or about, for, you know, what it's like to live with both OCD and eating disorder? You don't have to go into detail or anything, but anything that you could share that maybe could help our listeners? Yeah, um, I think it's really important to be open to challenging your, your ideas that you have about both disorders. So with OCD, um, being open to the idea that maybe you do have OCD and maybe it's not what you thought it was and that's okay. Um, being open to exposure therapy and doing things that feel very, very strange to you, um, but trusting your therapist, but also leaning into your own intuition and trusting that you know when something is off. Um, mm -hmm. And then for eating disorders, definitely thinking about like maybe what I believed about my body and my health is wrong and maybe there's a better, more beautiful way. Um, and so I think just leaning into that and definitely seeing specialists is, is so key, um, mm -hmm. who know what they're doing and who align with your values. So, mm -hmm. well, I think that having someone at the helm 
really talking about this so openly is, is, is so inspiring. And, you know, people really need, they just need to see if you can do it, kind of like you said, how you started your advocacy, if you can do it, they can do it. I mean, that's, that's really all we can do. (laughs) Honestly, it's It's, great to see other people doing it and reduce the shame around it. Yeah. So um, final question. Um, We're right about at time. Um, Someone may be listening to this and hearing your story and feeling inspired, but terrified. (laughs) So what would you tell someone if they have an idea or they're just like, I want to do something, but I don't know what, and I'm really scared. What would you tell them? What advice or suggestions would you give them? I am going to pause for a second and put my phone on the charger because I'm silly and (laughs) but I'm listening. (laughs) Okay. So um, the thing I would tell people is that it's okay if you're scared and do it anyways. Um, I think there's a lot of this idea of like, I'll do it when I don't feel as scared anymore or, um, you know, when those feelings go away. But I think it's important to remember that we're always going to have scared feelings about a lot of things, but we can lean into the discomfort and do it um, anyway and into the uncertainty. I'd also say um, really rely on your support systems and reach out to people um, because you might get negative feedback and and make sure that you're working through and processing the things that you want to share so that when there are inevitably feedback that maybe isn't helpful or um, might be hurtful, then you have people to lean on and um, ask for support from. Excellent. And I have a bonus question. Yes. <laughs> and it just came up while you were talking and I, cause I just kind of want to know what, how has advocacy helped with your own healing and recovery? Oh gosh. Yes. So um, I found Allegra on Inst or not found a friend recommended Allegra um, Allegra's account. And I, it was so healing to me. Um, I like, uh, I, it normalized so many thoughts for me and helped me so deeply to heal, um, and to start healing, I should say. Um, and so I would say it's really helped me because for example, I was on, um, Kimberly's podcast and I was talking about like all these ways that I've, um, worked through my OCD and I was like, ah, shoot, like, I really have to keep doing this because like, I'm telling people to do it as well. And so sometimes whenever I write something, I'll like look back weeks later when I'm struggling with it again. And I'm like, Ooh, I definitely <laughs> said like that's a good idea. Like I said something about, um, it was really funny. I said something about how, uh, like locking the door more than one smoke make it extra safe. And like two months later, I'm at my car, like locking it a couple of times. And I'm like, I know, (laughs) I know, but I just. (laughs) Uh, (sighs) It is important to remember that all the stuff we put out there. (laughs) Yes. Stays out there. (laughs) (laughs) Oh, no, I, I appreciate that. And I can, I can. I can completely re- relate. It's it's advocacy has brought like the most massive healing to me. Um, I occasionally struggle with when I am struggling with you're just a fraud and you shouldn't do advocacy. <laughs> but <laughs> I just want to emphasize to people and just echo what Mimi is saying, like, do it, just just do it. Get out there and do it. It's, you're not going to know anyway until you take the risk. I always say to people, don't say anything out loud that you are not willing to take negative feedback on but it's there's a lot you can say that is really going to resonate we have we have a good community we have a we have supportive people want to learn people want to advocate so be part of it come on come on up (laughs) come on up on the advocacy stage yes Mimi, thank you so much it is so lovely to i I said lovely and the lovely becoming is your (laughs) It is so lovely to meet you. And I just really want to thank you for all of your work and your content and all that you do for our community and the eating disorder community. I, and I just appreciate you. Thank you so much. And it's such a joy to meet you. And thank I you. know um, I'm really grateful for the work that you're doing as well. Oh, thank you. Thank you. And for those of you that are listening, um, thank you so much for being here. These these chats are really, really special because we dive into topics that aren't always talked about in our community and really just need a little bit more exposure. So that is what we do here by the fireside. So one more reminder, everybody, you got 
a little over 24 hours before you are going to click on to ignite the fire. Final thoughts on COVID 2020 right here at OCD Game Changers, Facebook and YouTube. You don't want to miss it. This is going to be fun. And also you're going to donate and it's going to be awesome because it's going to feel good to click and donate money to OCD Game Changers. <laughs> I'm trying to get creative on how to motivate you. Uh, but no, it really is going to be fun. It's a two hour and 45 minute event. So you can even click on for a little while, go eat dinner and then come on back and we'll still be going. And we can't wait to see you. Um, OCD Game Changers Facebook and YouTube channel will be live tomorrow night, 8 p.m. Eastern Standard Time. And then I'll see you again on Monday. Um, we're going to have the Monday Mavericks. Um, we're going to have Brian and Kelly. They have this awesome new venture they're doing, and I can't wait to learn more. Mimi, thank you for being here. You're awesome. And thank you. you. And thank you to all my, all my viewers and all of you that support OC Game Changers. We couldn't do this without you. We will see you tomorrow night. Bye.